I wasn't really sure what to speak on tonight, but when I looked up here, I saw this scripture, Ephesians 4.12, on the platform. So let's just turn to Ephesians 4.11. All right, we'll, just, we'll start there. And I have an iPad, by the way. I, uh, I don't know if this is called non-faith. I am a faith preacher. Of course, Jesus was a faith pre preacher, you know. Uh, people ask me, are you one of those faith people? And uh, I got stopped down at the post office not too long ago. A uh, gentleman stopped me and he said, you're the pastor up at Walk on the Water Faith Church up there, right? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, uh, I understand you're one of those health and wealth preachers. Well, what's the other options? <laughs> you know, no, I'm a sickness and disease and poverty preacher. Uh, would you like for me to lay hands on you so you can, you know, no, the, the reality is, is people, people want what they say they don't want. And people say, I don't need help, but they're hurting. And people get cleaned up and come to church, and we as ministers, we, we see them every Sunday, they're, but they're only projecting what they want you to see in them. And deep down inside, there are people who, who are on the edge, and they're just about ready to terminate themselves. But you wouldn't know it, because they clean up, they look sharp. I did have a gentleman call me one time and tell me that he was going to uh, end his life. He said he'd known me for 43 years, and he said, I, just, I respect you, and... Uh, I just want to give you a call and let you know that because I respect you, I'm, I'm going to take my life, and I just wanted you to know that I, I love you. I respect you. I said, well, I don't mean to bother, you know, your plan or anything, but I've got three calls on hold right now and two people waiting out in the waiting room, and I just really don't have time for this. Now, you've got to be led by the Spirit when you do stuff like this. Don't, don't, don't just do something. It's kind of like back in the 70s when one person had a car and they gave it away. They said, you know, God spoke to me, and, and then they got a brand new Lincoln with a, with a moon roof. Everybody else in the church gave their car away the next week, and everybody walked. You know, <laughs> it's just because, you know, you got to do what God tells you to do. So this guy told me he was going to end his life, and I said, well, wait, stop, just a moment. I said, do you really love me and respect me? He said, yeah. I said, can you just give me two hours? I said, right now, I'm, I assume you're sitting there with a, with a pistol loaded. And he said, yes, I am. I said, and you probably have one bullet. If you're any kind of a shot at all, you just need one bullet, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, would you take the bullet out, lay the gun down, and I'll give you a call at 6 o'clock. And I'll give you time to put the bullet back in the gun, put it up to your head or whatever you're doing right now, and we'll finish this conversation. He said, well, I, I, I guess I could do that. <laughs> so he took the bullet out and put the gun away. And at 6 o'clock, I almost forgot to call him. <laughs> but, but I did. But I did. I called him. And uh, I said, okay, go get the gun and the bullet and uh, let me know when you've got it loaded and we'll finish this conversation. He started laughing. He, he laughed so hard I couldn't hardly talk to him. He said, I got to thinking about what you said. When you, he said, we, we hung up the phone. He said, I'm sitting there holding this gun. I've taken the bullet out. And I'm thinking about what you said. But you don't have time to talk to me right now. Take, he, he said, I've been laughing for two hours. He said, I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, see, that's where the Spirit of God, as ministers of the gospel, we've got to be led by the Spirit of God. And you can't be led by a formula. You can't be led by what somebody else is doing. Somebody comes on the TV and says, this is the latest gimmick. This is the latest trick. You can't be led by that. You've got to be led by what God... Here's, here's a novel thought for ministers. Be led by the Spirit. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be nice? If ministers would be led by the Spirit. Well, the Scripture tells us, by the way, that's a good Scripture. Uh, Ephesians 4.11, And he himself gave, gave some to be what? Apostles, some what? Prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying 
of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith. Now it says that we all come to the unity of the faith. It doesn't necessarily mean that we all agree on everything all the time. I said it doesn't mean that we all agree on everything all the time. We come to the unity of the faith. Now, I'm getting old enough now. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I have gray hair. And I grew up in the era where I felt the best dressed man in America was Jimi Hendrix. Uh, of course, Loretta never did feel that way. She felt like Jackie Onassis, you know, or an airline stewardess with a pillbox hat was the way to go. And we looked like a real mismatched pair when we walked around because I was still six foot four, weighed 150 pounds, had big bell bottoms and big feet, big hair, you know, beads and, you know, that sandals and that type of thing. I looked like a Q-tip. <laughs> you know, it was... It, it, was, it was not a pretty sight. But uh, when I got saved, let's, let's, let me change that. I got saved at the age of seven. I went to a vacation Bible school and a man preached on hell like he had just gotten back. And, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I just kind of got scared into the kingdom of, of God. But the reality is uh, I grew up in the church. But I, I did get a little weird. Loretta, she was there. She knows. I, I, I got a little strange. But when I got a revelation of the Word of God, I, I was pastoring a Southern Baptist church and got filled with the Holy Spirit. Dima Shakarian told me one time, and he, he said, I think you have spoken at more full gospel businessmen's chapters than anybody else. I think I spoke at over 300 chapters because they would advertise. I was a Southern Baptist pastor that got filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, that was a big deal back then. But let me tell you something. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of unity of the faith. In fact, you know, I kind of got what they call the, the left foot of fellowship. People looked at me strange, and they thought I was weird. Of course, I was. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I, I know that's really hard for you guys to grasp, isn't it? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. What God has placed on my heart, you know, I, I have spent countless hours seeking God on what word He wants me to bring to this group of ministers. For me to, to show up and speak to people who are qualified to stand in the pulpit and preach the word of God, for me to say something to you, it needs to be worthwhile. You don't need to just hear another snappy sermon. You don't need to hear just some snappy stories. You need something that's actually going to impact you and help you focus your ministry so that you can do more accurately what it is that God wants you to do. We, we don't need just another sermon. We don't just need another sermon. And, and what is it, I ask God, is it that he wants me to impart to you? And what I kept receiving over and over and over again, and I don't know how all this is going to turn out because he hasn't really shown me yet, but I am to impart to you that there should not be a division in the body of Christ over things that really don't matter that he loves us and he loves us in such a way that he wants you to do what it is he wants you to do without you being under condemnation that somebody doesn't like what you do. I mean, first time Dr. Jim Willoughby showed up at ICFM with his shirt tail out <laughs> and wasn't wearing a tie, I mean, half of us old codgers looked at him like, 
where did he come from? And then we found out he came from California. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, it's not about whether you wear your shirt out or whether you wear your shirt in. It's not about whether you have choir robes, suits, or jeans. It's not about that. But with most church people, it's about that. That's what it's about. And we get so hung up on goofy things that don't really matter. What kind of a church are you? We see, people label us. One thing that always has bothered me, oh, well, there's a whole lot of things that's bothered me over the years, but one thing is, you know, when I first started coming to ICFM, I had a church of like three. It wasn't very big. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a little church. And people come up and they say, hey, how you doing? And How many are you running? And I felt like saying, well, I ran off about 15 last week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not about how many you're, why, why do we want to know how many you're running? Is, is it so that we can say, oh, you pastor a church of 75, that puts you in this slot. Oh, you pastor a church of 500, oh, you fit in this slot. I don't give a rip. How big your church is, all I'm looking for is somebody that's anointed and hears from God and has a revelation of the Word and they can speak into my life. And if you have a church of 10, you can speak into my life as far as I'm concerned, the same as somebody who's got a church of 10,000. The enemy works through division. I've heard people say, well, I don't know what I did wrong. Hello, condemnation. Don't receive it. I don't know what I did wrong. I mean, I, was, I had 150 people and 50 of them left. Well, you know what I do when 50 people leave? I take them right out to dinner. <laughs> but <laughs> God was the pastor of heaven. One third of the heavenly host had to go. And let me tell you something. I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but God didn't do anything wrong. I mean, God could have been walking all over heaven saying, what did I do? What did I do? Were, were we singing too quiet? Were we singing too loud? Did I preach too long? Did I receive an offering like Jim Willoughby? What did I do? <laughs> I only pick on people I love. And if I haven't picked on you yet, that doesn't mean anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, things, things don't always, you don't always understand why things are working out the way they work out anyway. I remember going to a full gospel businessmen's meeting, and I forget who it was, but I think, Loretta, I think it was Norval Hayes was speaking at the Lodge of Four Seasons, and I was so excited. Of course, I went to the Baptist church at the time, but I didn't hide it. See, I was one of these people, I just, I just told everybody what I did, you know, I just, because I was kind of like an in-your-face in kind of guy, kind of, in a way, in a nice way, in a nice way, in a nice way. So I went to this Full Gospel Businessmen's Convention, and when I got there, I'm telling you, it was amazing. So I drive back to this country town. We're going through this country town, Versailles, uh, where uh, our church was. And we pulled off at this little Dairy Queen place to uh, get a soda and just kind of rest for a moment and when we did there was a highway patrol car there now this highway patrolman was in my Sunday school class at the Baptist church and he was sitting there it was night he was sitting there in his a Missouri State Highway Patrol car with his hat you know you know the hat I'm talking about the, the hat with the glasses uniform and he's sitting there just parked on this summer evening in his car with the window down sitting there well I recognize him 
that he's from my Sunday school class. And so I pull up and park next to him, and I get out, and I walk over, and I'm still floating from this great meeting that I just came from. I mean, I am pumped. It was a full gospel businessmen's convention. I'm telling you, people were just doing everything there, you know. So uh, I said, you aren't going to believe what happened. He said, and he looked straight ahead and he said, what happened? I said, I went to a church service tonight. I said, no, it wasn't a church service. It was a convention service. And I said, the Spirit of God was there and the power of God. And he had his car window down. And so I, I kind of got down like this, you know, and at the highway patrol car. And, and I'm telling him this, and, oh. Okay, so I'm telling him this, and I'm all excited. Well, he's sitting in the car like this, and he is, he's got his glasses. It's night, and he's wearing his sunglasses. And he's sitting there, and I, I say, it was powerful. I, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God moved. I said, it was just like you're moving through thick air when you tried to walk up to the front. And he, and he looked at me, and he turned his head like this. He goes, did they speak in tongues? I said, yes, yes, yes. Well, I, that's when I found out the Missouri State Highway Patrol cars have electric windows. Because he just, you know, the, the window closed. He put that patrol car in reverse and peeled out backwards, flew gravel all over the place. Well, to me, you know, was, I kind of thought like, wow, I'm trying to witness to this guy. And I thought of the scripture, you know, throwing your pearl before swine type thing. Because you know how you feel. Like, pfft. well, <laughs> then the Lord spoke to me and said, my word never returns void. Because I was giving him some word too. He said, my word never returns void. Well, years go by. Years go by. And I have a friend uh, I've known him from when he very first started in politics. When I first met him, he uh, came to my office and his trunk, he held his trunk down with a coat hanger. And he was running for attorney general of our state, of the state of Missouri. His name was John Ashcroft. And so I developed a relationship with him. And he, came, he made attorney general of the state of Missouri. Then he made governor of the state of Missouri, and he was going to run for Senate, and he lost to a man that died in the race. And, uh, I mean, there, he, my nickname from him, uh, the governor would call me, and he, he'd call me Jimmy. It was Jimmy Swaggart was his <laughs> nickname for me. Of course, he, he, John Ashcroft, would travel to full gospel businessmen's meetings and sing. He was a singer at Full Gospel Business, a spirit-filled Christian. He loved the Lord, powerful. In fact, when he was Attorney General of the United States, right after 9-11, Loretta and I went to Washington, D.C., went into the Justice Department and held a, a, a Bible study with his staff in the Justice Department. And there was like eight or nine people is all that was there. And they had their morning Bible study. And John Ashcroft asked them, he said, have you remember, do you have your memory verse for today memorized? And his staff was kind of like, well, we, the memory verse was an entire chapter of Psalms. And he said, okay, here it is. And he, he led them through it. He had it memorized. He was a great man of God. But when he was the governor of the state of Missouri, this patrolman, that patrolman was elevated up through the ranks and became head of the governor's security. He was his number one security guard. Well, my family, for years, and they still do, had a boat business and a marina and that type of thing. And uh, John Ashcroft stored his boat at our marina. And he had an 18-foot boat at this particular time, and he wanted to put new carpet in it. Well, <laughs> it's interesting. He wanted to put new carpet in it himself. I mean, you know, it cost $50, $75 labor, but he would save it. So in order to save money, they had four security guards stand around him all day while he <laughs> changed, <laughs> changed the carpet in, in my shop. You know what I mean? Well, but he would show up at, at our shop with his Bermuda shorts, you know, and, and his T-shirt. And the security guards always dressed the same as him. 
but you could tell they were security guards because they had the little spiral things coming out of their ears and they wore the glasses and they had guns, you know. And so you could still tell that they were security guards. Well, the head of the security was this highway patrolman. So that particular day, as the governor is, is leaving my office and everything and the security guards in their, in their Bermuda shorts, you know, they're, all, they're doing this thing, they all walk out. And the head of security, this man, all these years later, head of security, he sticks his head in the door as the governor goes out and he sees me across this showroom, probably about as far as from here to the sound booth. And he says, here he is, head of Missouri State Security for the governor. And he says, Larry. I said, yes. I just want you to know something. I went with the governor. He spoke at a meeting. And they all spoke in tongues. <laughs> it's real. It's real. <laughs> so after all this time, see, the, the seeds that we plant, they're not worthless seeds. you got to be led by the Spirit. Sometimes you may witness to somebody that it looks like, or in your church you may do something and you think, why am I doing this? Here's the key, be led by the Spirit. Don't be led by other people. Don't be led by your soul. You don't, you're not led by what you see or what you hear or what other people think. You can't go by what other people think. I don't mean to embarrass my good friend. I really do love him with all my heart. But Cole Stringer over there, wave at everybody, Cole. Cole Stringer's uh, ICFM president in Australia. I've been over to his house. I've stayed at his house several times. Well, it's actually Jan's house. But <laughs> well, Loretta and I have stayed there several times. I've taken my grandson over there. Uh, in fact, I'll be over there uh, at ICFM and Margaret Courts in 2013. But Cole uh, was at my church yesterday and uh, we, we televise uh, we, you know it goes in it's streamed live streaming and it goes into several nations and different places and he spoke Loretta and I talked about he spoke one of the best messages now okay now I'm just telling you right now not because he's here but now listen up he spoke one of the best messages I think I've ever heard he spoke on the power of grace, how we should not walk under condemnation and we're not under the law. And he spoke it balanced. He spoke it true. He backed everything up with Scripture. There was nothing left out there. It was all clean, concise, proven by Scripture, everything he said. There's no way anybody that can read a Bible could ever have disputed anything he said. It was magnificent. When he was done, I was just like, oh my, this is, this is, that was an amazing message. It was good. Well, someone sent me this letter immediately that I got after he spoke. He says, Dear Pastor Larry, this came in over the internet by way of Facebook. Oh, you, don't you just love Facebook? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Dear Pastor Larry, I don't know if you will ever read this. <laughs> Great vote of confidence. I don't know if you will ever read this, but I need to say something. I have loved Wow Faith Church. That's Wow. That's my church, Walk on the Water. Wow Faith Church for several years, and your family as well. Now, let me say this. This lady and her husband had a church, a huge church, what we would call a huge church in St. Louis. But uh, they're no longer pastoring. She said... Uh, I've loved Wow Faith Church now for several years and your family as well. Wow has been a retreat for me since we no longer pastor. I thought I had found a faith church. But after today, I see you're going a different direction, which is called the grace doctrine. I have cried and prayed all day. I know you will never be able to give up your friend Cole, that's what she says, right? There. She spelled your name wrong. C O A L. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was prophetic. Now it's just pathetic. That's what it is. You ever get a somebody thinks it's a prophetic word and you think it's a pathetic word? All right. I know you will never be able to give up your friend Cole, even though I can't help but think you have to be questioning your decision now. 
I hope you, I hope and pray that you will give thought to all the little sheep that will be hurt, left behind at the rapture, and even miss heaven because of your decision. So we preached on grace, and now I am a grace fanatic, according to this person, because I allowed somebody to, I had the audacity to allow someone to stand in my pulpit and preach on grace. That's nuts. <laughs> That's nuts. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace we are saved through faith. And what I've discovered, because now that I am in social security brackets, I, I, have, I have discovered that the people who are against the current move of God are usually the ones who are the leaders of the previous move of God. And I have seen this happen over and over again in my short lifespan. And I just want to say this, I don't see anywhere in the Word where grace is a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, listen, thank you. <laughs> it, I don't see where grace is a bad thing. Faith is not a bad thing. Love is not a bad thing. These, these are good things. Because without grace, we're, we're under the law. And I know one thing for sure. Bob Romando is not good enough to get saved <laughs> without grace. <laughs> but with grace, we are made righteous. And we are just as righteous one day after we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior as we will be the day we die after having lived a holy life at the age of 119, Cole made a statement. He said, there's nothing that you can do that can make God love you anymore. Then he followed it up and he said, there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. Because you've got to keep in mind that God loved you before you were as cool as you are now. God loved you when you were yet in sin. You say, well, you know, but I've had bad things happen to me, and I just feel so guilty because I just don't know what I've done to cause these things to happen. Well, you know, sometimes you didn't do anything. I said, sometimes you didn't do anything. When Loretta and I were first married, we lived in Kansas City, and they had a patrolman that lived next door. And we left one day and left the house all locked up with, without the air conditioning on. And when we came back after a day or two or three, I'm not even sure how much it was, but it was a while. I was supposed to take a turkey and put it, we had eaten part of a turkey, and I was supposed to take it and put it in the refrigerator, but I had forgot and I left it out on the counter. And this turkey, listen, think of the worst smell you have ever smelled in your life. It was worse than that. I'm telling you, it, when we got back to the apartment and I opened up the door, it went out into the parking lot. I thought it was going to change the color of the paint on the front of the car. I'm telling you, it was, it was an aroma like I will never forget it. You know how they say there's certain smells you never forget? I will never forget rancid turkey ever in my life. So, whoo, I mean, it was bad. So I told Loretta, I'll take care of it. Well, you know, I'm a man, the way I take care of it is I just took, I, you know, I had to like run in, hold my breath. I'd hold my breath and run into the apartment. And I got all the turkey bones and everything, and I ran out and put them in the dumpster. And then I came back in, and there was this pan with all this soupy, gooey stuff in it. You know, kind of look what they, like what they have on CSI after they find a person in a tub for six years, you know, or whatever. All, it was awful. It was, and it was just, I mean, if you moved it, and it was almost full. 
And I, the only thing I could think of to do was to put it in the sink. So I go over and I put it in the sink. I pour it in the sink. It just like it was like ooze. It was like goo. Well, what I didn't know is the patrolman who lived in the apartment next to us knew we were out of town and he thought this would be a good time for him to fix his sink. And the sinks were back to back. You know, like the drain from our sink went into the wall and the drain from his sink went into the wall. And we didn't know it, but he had taken like the little gooseneck and everything. He had taken all that out of his sink because he's going to put in a new one. And in order to get this new one in, because it was up in one of these places, he had, he, he kind of like crawled up inside the cabinet and he was in the cabinet getting ready to put the new gooseneck on when a barrage of goo. I'm telling you the awfulest smelling goo you've ever smelled in your life. I heard a scream on the other side. I thought, I thought somebody was beating somebody to death on your because he was trying to get out. All this goo, was, and he was trapped in the cabinet. And you know, you could, and you could hear it, and he was a policeman, so he was, you know, and just screaming and pounding. I said, man, there, something's going on over there. We need to call the police. We moved. Uh, <laughs> but the reality, here, here's the reality. That guy didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> you say, what's this story got to do with anything? Okay, well, I know a lot of my stories don't have anything to do with anything. But, <laughs> but this, this one does. This one does. The point is, the guy didn't do anything wrong. He, he didn't do anything wrong. He was just fixing his sink. Well, you know what? Sometimes you're just trying to fix something in life. You're trying to fix something in your family, trying to fix something in the church, trying to fix your finances, just something. Trying to fix your kids. Excuse me, Sherry. <laughs> I wasn't referring to mine. But, you know, you're trying to fix something, and right in the middle of you trying to fix something, you get dumped on in the worst way. And you say, what did I do? Well, let me tell you, maybe you didn't do anything. I said, maybe you didn't do anything. But the enemy, this is where condemnation comes in. The enemy comes in trying to condemn you. And if you're condemned, you're not going to be functioning the way you should be functioning in the kingdom of God. You're not going to be following the vision you should be following in the kingdom of God. And you're not going to be running at peak efficiency in your church, in your ministry, and in your life when you feel condemned like you did something wrong and the scripture says that God so loved the world that he sent his son John 3 16 we all know that but John 3 17 of course says for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world so let me tell you something if you feel condemned it's not God see the grace of God draws people and condemnation repels them And, sad to say, there's a lot of people that just preach nothing but condemnation. See, grace, Andrew Murray said, grace is the power to do God's will. I like that. It's the ability to be sustained on the inside while things are being accomplished on the outside. While I'm reaching out in faith, I need a substance on the inside to sustain me while I'm waiting for things to come to pass on the outside. And grace empowers us. I said grace is a good thing. And we can't come against people preaching grace because we're faith people. I said we can't come against people preaching grace because we're faith people. Now somebody may say, well, no, but there's weird people teaching grace. Well, there's weird people teaching faith. Just be as smart as Brother Hagin's cow. Remember? He said, he said, 
chew the hay and spit out the sticks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and we hear little phrases like sloppy agape or extreme grace. Um, sloppy agape, I think that's a, an insult to God. Because God is agape. God's not sloppy. That's like saying sloppy God. And extreme grace? Oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> Hello. That's when people say, you know, are you one of those name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, lip it and grip it people? <laughs> well, yeah. Guilty. They say, well, oh, okay. <laughs> That's what we are. Grace is extreme. You know, Brother Keith Moore, speaking at our church one time, and he said, don't you think you know that God, that God knows when the cup's full? But his cup runs over. I mean, is it just that God doesn't understand when the cup is full? Is he kind of like, doesn't understand? Does, does he not know how many fish it takes to break a net? I used to have a lady work for me. Actually, she still does over... Her name's Annette, and I was reading that scripture about Jesus said, cast Annette overboard. It's a, okay. But God is a cup running over, net breaking. Do you think he miscalculated on feeding the 5,000? He just accidentally made too much. He's like my mom at Thanksgiving, he just made too much. He didn't figure it right. No. He's excessive. He's extreme. I would rather have an extreme God than a stingy God. Hmm. You know, the grace can't even be compared to one man's fall. Oh, I like that. His grace is so great and powerful, we can't even comprehend it. Legalism says if we can be good enough, God says, you are good enough, not because of what you've done, but because of what I've done. Grace is being able to have all the benefits, even though you don't deserve any of them. Cole, I don't mean to just steal one of your illustrations, but he told the story uh, of a man sitting there with his son, and I hope I tell it right. He's sitting there with his son, and somebody comes in and shoots the son dead. He can be, you said, legalistic and turn the man over to the police. Or he could take the gun and shoot the man, and that would be revenge. Or he could take the guy and adopt him and give him everything that his son would have had grace you know grace is being able to have all the benefits even though we don't deserve it Matthew 7 11, Jesus said if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more say much more how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him he's a good God or Roberts got in trouble years ago for saying God is a God is good and the devil's bad. The people who got upset the most were preachers. Why? It messed with their theology of the doctrine or movement that they were in. I'm not advocating a doctrine. I'm not saying we need to be grace people or faith people. Or I'm just saying let's just be God people. You know, Jesus didn't say have faith in grace. He didn't say have faith in faith. He didn't say have faith in, in your church building. He didn't say have faith in anybody. He said have faith in God, Mark 11:22. Trust God. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, Paul said, how many of you know, uh, I know some of you know this, I shared it in a seminar one time, but uh, recently there's been theological evidence that uh, Paul the Apostle's father was one of the uh, thieves that was crucified with Jesus. 
working on it. Because, well, Paul even alluded to it one time. He said, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> Every false religion. <laughs> Every false religion is based upon what you can do for your God. As Cole was sharing yesterday, and I thought this was interesting. Muslims have to face east and pray five times a day. That's bondage. Mormons have to wear a certain kind of underwear. That's bondage. I'm telling you, there, every religion is all about what you can do for your God, what you can sacrifice for your God. But true Christianity is what God has sacrificed for us. And it's different. It's different. And we need to understand that. Wow. Okay, I'm just about done. <laughs> kind of, in a way. You know, there's a, the minister took his watch off and laid it down, and the little boy out there said to his dad, he said, Dad, what's that mean when he keeps taking his watch off and laying it down? And the man says, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Romans 5.20. You know, people say, well, if you, if you start talking about grace... You're just giving people a license to sin. Well, I've learned from experience, they don't need a license. They'll do it. If they're going to do it, they don't need a license. They'll just do it. So you're not giving them a license to sin. And as one great minister said, uh, do we just not tell them the truth because we don't think they can handle it? Or are we going to lie to the people? No. The reality is, for by grace... We've been saved through faith. For by grace, it's not by the works of righteousness that we've done. It's not what we do. You know, it's, it's just a good thing you don't get what you deserve. I said, it's just a good thing you don't get what you deserve. We get what he deserves. We become joint heirs. Yeah. <laughs> I said that a few years ago. In the, this, this old, old hippie in the back, he goes, huh? <laughs> he thought I was talking about something else. <laughs> Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Let me tell you something. You can't out -sin grace. Now, you won't want to. I said you won't want to. But if you make a mistake, there's always more grace. If, if you make a Category 5 mistake, God's got Category grace waiting, 6 grace waiting for you. You make a Category 7 mistake, he'll just bump it up, and he has Category 8 grace for you. Grace will always overpower anything that the enemy can deliver. All right. Well, I think I'm probably going to close now. Um, but like you guys, I could go on all night. But since I didn't get a great response at that point, I think I will close. Uh, <laughs> write, write this down. If you've got a pencil, most people don't have a pencil anymore. They, they have iPads and iPods, and Jim's got an iRita. And, uh, I mean, everybody's, everybody's got something, you know. But he, here's how much I trust mine. See, here's my iPad with all my notes, but then I print them out too. <laughs> and, well, because, you know, you might have, what do they call those, an EM what? EMP? You know, if we have one of those kind of things. That's my smart daughter over there. But if you have a pencil, write this down. I'm righteousness. I'm righteous not by my works, but by his work that was completed in me. I'm righteous, not by my works, but by his works that were completed in me. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's a grace verse. Hmm. Galatians 2.21, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times and probably preached it better than me many times, but it says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. 
You know, we have defining moments in our life where things happen and God speaks to us. And I've heard from several of you in the last few weeks about some things that are defining moments. You know, I, I remember certain places where I was at certain times and somebody said something. I remember the day that I got stuck in the elevator with T.L. Osborne and in 1972, I believe it was. And so what did we talk about? Well, he told me what he was going to preach on that morning and that evening. And I said in both of his meetings, that morning he preached on Satan is a liar. He used John 8, as his text where Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And he says, you guys are just like your, your father, Satan. He's a liar, always has been, always will be. And he said, Satan is a liar. There's no truth in him. And then that night he spoke on it's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1, 2 and Hebrews 6, 18 were the two text scriptures. He says, God cannot lie. So here we have a God who cannot lie and a devil who cannot tell the truth. And that was a defining, it, it changed the course of my ministry. We have those defining moments. Well, I had one other defining moment, and I'm going to share it with you right now. And uh, then I will close. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I'll, I'm going to close anyway just to be gracious. <laughs> Loretta had a uh, little German shepherd that she liked and we had a Bible study at our house one night and uh, she wanted to show the German shepherd to the people at the Bible study but we couldn't find it. Now we, we lived out uh, seven miles, six, seven, eight miles down a gravel road. We lived on a lake. We had a, a, a house where you could see the lake from all four sides and it, it was nice and this is back when we thought we were going to retire. It was I had been traveling in the ministry, but I was not pastoring. I would never do that. I would never pastor. Um, you know, because in our area, well, they call them pastures in our area. You know, we live, we're hill, you want to know what a hillbilly looks like all cleaned up? Okay, Jed Clampett. I mean, this is what we're like. And, uh, but they, they call them pastures. And I wondered one day why they called them pastures. And then I figured out, well, pastures, pastors, sheep do the same thing to both. And uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be a, a pasture. So I was kind of fighting that. And uh, so we wanted, Loretta wanted to show these people at the Bible study her dog, but we couldn't find the dog. And she really loved this dog. And his name was Candle. And... Uh, so I went out and I, I walked around kind of the woods around her house trying to find this dog that night and I couldn't find it. And Loretta went to sleep that night a little uneasy that I couldn't find her special little German Shepherd dog. And so the next morning I, I wanted peace. I like peace. And so I immediately before breakfast went to find the dog because I knew that that would help bring peace into our house. And because uh, Loretta had lost a couple of dogs, and we just couldn't lose one more dog, and she loved this little dog. And so I walked around and walked around, and I finally found a clearing, uh, and there were some houses on the lake on the other side of this little gravel road, and there's this big clearing area, and there's one big cedar tree out there, and I saw something that looked like a little rug or something under the cedar tree, and I thought, well, maybe that's Candle. Candle's asleep over under the cedar tree, and so I went over to the cedar tree, and I found Candle, and Candle wasn't asleep. Candle was kind of like this, with the tongue hanging out. Candle was dead. Candle was a dead dog, and I thought maybe, you know, that if we could do some kind of resuscitation, you know. You know, I've seen them in movies, you know, beat on chests of things, and, you know, they start breathing again. But rigor mortis had set in, and flies were there, and it was, it was not really all that pleasant. And when I moved the dog, the whole dog just moved. It was, it was a dead dog. Well, I really didn't want to go back to the house and tell Loretta that I found her dog, and it was dead. And all of a sudden, the Scripture came to me that they'll lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, and, and they'll raise the dead. I thought, well, you know, if you can raise a dead person, it must be easier to do a dog. You know, it wouldn't be as hard, wouldn't be as complicated. So 
But there's houses over there, and I didn't want anybody to see anything, so I just kind of like stood there and turned my back to the houses, kind of put my hand down like this, and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to this dog, and I command it to come to life now. And I kind of looked down, and I could still see a fly crawling on its eye, and I thought, well, that didn't work, you know. And so I thought, well, maybe... See, I went to Southwest Baptist University, and they taught us how to preach. Three points in a poem, and if the poem could make women, women cry, it was a really good sermon. And, uh, but they also told us how to evangelize, too. You know, and, there certain, and so, But then I'd been going to full gospel businessmen's meetings, and I'd seen them lay hands on people, so I thought, I'm going to lay hands on this. I'm gonna, just going to lay hands on the dog, but those, there might be people over there. And I saw one guy kind of mulling around his yard. I didn't want to make a big scene, so I kind of kind of just leaned over like this and kind of touched the edge of the dog and I said in the name of Jesus arise nothing happened so then I determined that it would be easier for me to be embarrassed in front of the people than it would be to go back and face Loretta and tell her her dog was dead so I decided that I was going to just go all out and I knelt down and I put one hand on this dog and I raised the other one to heaven and, okay, just, could you do that one again? And I leaned, I put my hand on that dog, and I said, in, because, you know, you get Pentecostal. I said, in the name of Jesus, I speak to this dog, and I command you, live. And I kind of looked over there, and, the guy was holding a rake, <laughs> looking at me. And the dog was dead. I mean, it was just dead. It, it's, it's like it even got deader. I don't know. It just, it just, I looked at it. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I've got some bargaining chips here. I've been traveling around. Demas Shkarian told me I spoke at more chapters than anybody else. And I've been contemplating, you know, leaving the family business and, and maybe going into the ministry or something. And I, so I just, I just said, Father, you know, <laughs> you ever try to con God? You know, your people do it all the time at church. Try to con God. You try to explain to him like he doesn't know. God, you know Loretta really loves this dog. And you know that this is an important thing in her life. And here's what I'll do, God. You bring this dog back to life. And I'm going to go back home with Candle to Loretta. And you do that, I will quit the family business. I will go 100% for you, full time. I'll travel I'll be a pastor. I'll do anything, God. If you just raise this dog from the dead. And then the defining moment came when I heard God speak to my heart. And he said, okay, Larry, let's get this straight. My son was dead, and I raised him from the dead. And that's not enough. But if I raise this dog from the dead, you'll do it. Now, I raised my son from the dead, and you won't do it. But if I raise this dog from the dead, you'll do it. You'll do for a dog what you wouldn't do for my son. I'm done. I think sometimes we need to understand some things. It's time to bring some reality into our lives as ministers. It's time to bring reality into praise and worship. It's time to bring reality into our preaching. It's time for us to be real with God. Quit playing games. Quit fighting with each other. Quit bickering over what somebody else has preached someplace else that you heard they said when in reality probably they didn't really say what you heard they said to begin with. Let's do... Let's do something different. Let's love each other. 
And let's assume the best instead of assuming the worst. Now let's quit trying to bargain with God on stuff. He's already, he's already done everything he needs to do. There's nothing that needs to be added to his work. He paid the ultimate price in full. And when we try through legalism to add to what it is that needs to be done, what we're saying is the sacrifice of Jesus wasn't enough. It's like me standing out there with that dog. I'm saying, hey, okay, I agree. You raised your, your son Jesus from the dead, but that wasn't quite enough. Let's, let's add a dog to it. And that's what we do a lot of times without realizing it. And the word that I feel God wants me to speak to these great men and women of God, and I highly respect you, is this. Let's listen to God. Let's be led by the Spirit. And there may be division in other people, but don't let there be division in us. There may be animosities with other people, but let's don't let them be in us. As for me and my house, my ministry, my house, my children, if people draw a little circle someplace and say, well, this is the circle we're in and you're outside the circle, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to draw a bigger circle that includes them. Jesus said, nevertheless, the gospel is being preached. 